Hi, Eugene. It's uh, it's so great to see you. Thank you for uh, taking the time out of your really busy schedule uh, to to chat with us. I spent this weekend watching your documentary. I just enjoyed it tremendously. The, the historical references, just amazing. So congratulations on, on pulling this together in such a amount of time. But before we get to your project, um, I just want to see how you're doing, how you're feeling, how you personally have been sort of impacted by the events that have been building up over the months and, uh, and obviously culminated in the horrific events last week in Atlanta. Oh, thank you for having me, Robert. I feel intense anger. I feel grief for the victims and families. Most of all, though, I think I feel incredibly frustrated. And I'm frustrated that the thesis of my documentary had to center on the fact that Asians are often treated as invisible and silent. And that we haven't been able to talk about these issues openly enough, even in our own families. That we've historically been judged by our approximation to whiteness and that some of us have perpetuated the false protection of assimilation. And these systems we're part of have pitted us against other marginalized groups. And so many of us exist within this vast diversity of Asian American experience that just is completely erased. So I'm really frustrated that the six Asian women who were murdered and the elderly who are attacked are the voices that we typically never get to hear. You go back a hundred years and you, you see like literally the same thing, people calling Chinese immigrants dirty and you know, thinking that they carry diseases, taking jobs, all this stuff. You see it like, it's, it's been happening, right? And it's crazy that it's still a hundred years later, um, we're, we're back here again. And I was looking at your uh, Twitter feed and uh, one of your tweets uh, actually caught my attention. Um, what's so enraging about these attacks on Asian elders is how, in my experience, my older relatives minimize their pain, opinions, and the space they occupy in order to unburden others. They mind their own business while trying to survive. Targeting them feels especially cruel. I, I, I thought this was incredibly uh, powerful, sad, you know, I can somewhat relate because as a first generation immigrant, I kind of know what are the things that you're talking about. So sort of seeing the Asian elders as sort of selfless um, folks who are trying to mind their own business to be attacked is just horrific. And um, I, I really like when I when I saw this tweet, it just spoke so deeply uh, to me. And um, I, I can imagine that for you, um, you know, growing up here and growing up in Texas, this played a big role sort of in how you're feeling at the moment. Can you share a little bit more about that? It's, it's really sad that the, the truth is that the most at risk in our communities are often the ones who are most afraid to speak out. And a lot of them are just trying to survive. And this includes a lot of stories that are not necessarily represented by my face or voice. I think that's something that's like, we should, we should make clear. You know, I often center my experience when I tell my story about being a, one of the few Asians in a Southern middle-class community. And I've learned, you know, especially through this project that, you know, even that is not necessarily the story that will push this conversation forward. Because yeah, I was bullied, I was depressed. Um, my experience is valid, but I also see that my own relationship and struggle with my quote, quote unquote, Americanness, which we sometimes refer to as whiteness, I think about the victims uh, and how many of them probably don't even speak English as their primary language. Many don't have access to the education that I was privileged to, and they are just as American as I am. So I take most of my early experiences growing up and think about that if I present my biography, I just hope that whatever comes out of this conversation, we see other biographies that are presented alongside mine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my relationship with these attacks are perhaps not necessarily shared by most other Asians. But at the core, I just feel that the more we all are able to engage and talk about it, the more we can be exposed to the diversity that really exists within our community. You've put out what's probably the best coming out video ever. And uh, I know in the video, you call it the most important video that you will have ever made for the internet. 
but it touches on one important thing that you're a person who feels the responsibility to speak out for two communities, right? The uh, uh, Asian community, as well as the LGBTQ plus community. How has this weighed on you sort of being sort of one to speak up for both? Can you um, speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I guess one lesson is ultimatums probably aren't healthy. I think <laughs> you, you learn that perhaps placing utmost importance on everything you do with care is probably the best way to move forward, especially if you're engaged in these types of conversations about race, identity, sexuality. The most important aspect of that is speaking up and speaking out in the way that you know how. Um, we see that happening right now with Asian Americans, with trans people fighting for their rights and visibil visibility. And I, I think that, that the ignorance and repudiation of any group who's just carrying something heavy that's further burdened by current events is a great source of strife and separation in our country. And I think that's perhaps why I focus on this effort in this particular piece about talking more about how we feel because communication is paramount. And that means different things for different people. One thing I point out in the documentary is that for us, communication starts at home. It starts with parents and neighbors and people who maybe have not felt compelled to speak out about it before. And in my coming out video, I actually chose an opposite direction of trying to express something without words that was a, a representative of my feeling of, of the, the struggle of not being able to say or verbalize my truth uh, about being gay to my families. Um, and this was just an instance where it's very clear being part of a community that has historically been ignored in a lot of ways in America, whether it be not educating others on our history or not being able to have the tools to engage with other marginalized groups, you know, we have to start talking about anti-Asian hate. We have to start talking about how different our experiences are because the only way I could even touch the surface, you know, the, the tip of this glacier was with a documentary that's over an hour long with as many perspectives as I, could, I can include, but hopefully that's just like, that's just a, a model for people to see that they can take into their own lives. Every conversation needs to be over an hour. Every conversation has to have more than just your perspective. And hopefully the, the biggest takeaway people will have is that the Asian voice is diverse and it's strong. And I'm sure there are a lot of people watching who totally disagree with everything I say. And I think that's really, really vital to recognize, to move forward, especially in such a uh, time that's, that's laid with with discrimination against Asian Americans at large. So you mentioned, you know, this is a hour long documentary. This is atypical for you, right? This is not what you normally do. Can you, can you shed a little bit about your creative process and how you ended up where it ended up? Because I'm not sure that that was the original intent, right? No. It evolved. You know, this might be a good time to also point out something that I hope makes sense and can relate me to any viewer watching, which is I'm not an expert. I'm not an educator. I'm not a professor in any of these, these fields. The process in which I at least took the responsibility to say, I need to learn more about this if I'm going to use my platform to speak to many people about a serious issue that's not often discussed. It went from me thinking I was going to post something that was from the heart and very succinct to an over month long process that involved multiple guests who gave me a lot of perspectives that I w wasn't even expecting. Uh, over 10 chapters of content that is deeply ingrained in history that I wasn't even exposed to. You know, as smart as I might appear or sound in the documentary, I was learning about a lot of that too at the same time. And all it took me to do that was to be open, to be aware that I was also not the smartest person in the room. And I think that those lessons, even as the producer and the host of this piece, is um, really enriching in terms of the way I'm moving forward and even talking about these issues with you know, other Asian Americans, with other communities. And there's basically no other way to have a conversation about something like anti-Asian hate without giving it the full breadth that you possibly can afford to give with the timeliness. I mean, here, here's one thing. I started over a month ago and then 
the Atlanta shootings happened last week. And even in that moment, you, you recognize I wasn't able to touch on misogyny towards Asian women as much as I could have. And that is, again, pointing to the fact that racism and discrimination will always happen, but the conversation always has to keep catching up to it and, in fact, needs to precede it. And so we have to just keep talking and we have to keep speaking out because it's the only way that we can have some solutions or answers the next time something like this happens. You know, I, I mentioned I learned quite a lot through, um, um, through watching it and had to watch it a couple of times. Uh, but the, the complex relationship between the Asian um, uh, and black communities, it's like very eye-opening for me. AAPI folks have been here for hundreds of years, but the reality for black folks is we've been here twice as long and experienced oppression for twice as long and have different experiences, but the source is the same. I think what we have to do is partly what you're doing right now, and highlight the truth and highlight people's experiences and stories. They're all valid. Even the people who are upset and angry and want to lash out. You know, in all honesty, it was one of the primary reasons I first decided to produce this. I think it is a tough conversation for anyone to have, especially when the onus is reflecting on yourself and your culture as well. We lose a lot of the nuance and empathy when we solely talk about these complicated issues online. and. Mm -hmm. You know, when the policing question uh, arose and the debate sort of erupted when anti-Asian uh, task force were, were put into cities, that debate sort of brought to light a lot of the core discriminatory perspectives we have towards one another because it reduced many Asians being told that we were just basically white Americans who didn't experience racism. While on the flip side, you have black and brown communities who are being informed by some Asians that supporting more policing uh, showed that we didn't give a damn about the important lessons that we all learned from the Black Lives Matter movement. And if we were really in solidarity with communities, we have to remain vigilant, informed, and open to these issues because those differences, they've always been there. And I think the biggest thing is not equating our differences. It is recognizing that we have different experiences that are in no way the same, but we can identify the source, the problems that might have affected all of our communities. Um, and that shared recognition is really important to, to understand that there is a way forward that does not involve further separation of our individual struggles as cultures. And I think that the ways in which many of us, especially who were uh, inspired by and involved in BLM, I think it was important to see that that sort of engagement with communities across color lines was not impossible. And okay. the idea that the Asian American community is facing a very particular issue, especially in the wake of COVID, that there is solidarity that can happen, but it has to start with us being open, truthful. And honestly, we have to have some really, really painful, intense conversations. You know, I always say it's so much easier. It's so lazy to fall back on racist ideology and to disagree with someone. It's the easiest thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. It is so difficult in your homes, with your friends, to constantly be engaged with this idea that we are all experiencing the world and these events differently and uniquely as people from different backgrounds. And that idea that we can recognize things like the history of pervasive anti-blackness in the Asian community, but also recognize that Asian people have experienced real trauma and real, real deep, intense racism through the history of, since the Chinese Exclusion Act, all the way up until um, the moment that that, sorry, that mother opened fire in the spas. This is something that is ingrained. We cannot shy away from having those difficult conversations because if we don't, again, the silence is, is what's going to kill all of us. And I think that that has, to, that has to end. We have to be open and we have to be vocal. And speak up. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, I'm going to use 
one more example from the documentary, which I, I personally have learned in it and was very eye opening. And it was the um, you exploring the the murder of uh, Vincent Chin, and uh, how that was the turning point in the national awareness of anti Asian sentiment, and how how you were not actually aware of that growing up. Vincent Chin's story, especially, is heartbreaking because that was the rallying cry for many Asian Americans to realize that a perpetrator is only going to see us all as one thing. So to be unified as Asian American was really important. Um, after the hate crime that killed Vincent Chin. That was something that I have zero exposure to growing up. I had zero awareness. No one told me about Vincent Chin. No one, no one even shared his story. And, it's, and what's so sad there is that, the, again, the through line of communication, we are all going through so many similar feelings of that othering, the ostracization in... Yeah. Whatever community pockets of communities we were, we were within, but many, many of our families, you know, were just trying to survive. They were just trying to make sure that they could raise their families in, in a country without, without being targeted. What are some of the other things that you've learned during the making of this doc that you just did not know about your community? One of the greatest lessons I learned from this documentary was that although my thesis is about talking more, because there is a cultural stereotype about Asians about being silenced and being silent, um, the, the history that we have in this country is, is riddled with outspoken Asian activists who have stepped up to the plate, who have worked across color lines, who have engaged and protested and fought since the, the first Chinese migrants came here to work on the railroads and formed a union. Like th there's so many examples in which Asian Americans have been outspoken and engaged with the, the system. And I think that the, the unfortunate truth is, is that those systemic forces can be so oppressive and so large that we find ourselves back in a situation again where an entire community is scapegoated because of something like the perception of disease. When you have systems at play that can afford presidents like Trump to spew anti-Asian rhetoric that affects millions of people, that is going to be a sinister and powerful wave that is even hard to combat when you are just you know, one activist, one protester, one group trying to stand up. That's why we have to come together, not just as an Asian American community, but as a community as a whole that reaches across every single community to say, whether it's Black Lives Matter or anti-Asian hate or the issues we have with um, indigenous populations, with the pipeline, with uh, all the, um, the battles we have with ICE. Like all of these things are, are shared in terms of not the experience specifically, but there is a source in terms of the system that we have to see the bigger picture, appraise it, and know how to address it so we can create solutions that are actually workable. Because the only other option is, is furthering the divide between many different groups. And the only hope that you can have is that with this increased communication, you can start at the very least exposing younger people to different perspectives and to hopefully change the few minds that are willing to hear someone else out. Clearly, it, it seems you're trying to raise awareness and influence people's thinking, making sure that they get educated and, and hopefully change their perspectives. But I, I think you've also joked that you're not afraid of getting trolled, right? Because that comes with the territory a little bit of being an outspoke, outspoken person as you are. How do you handle the negativity that comes along with this? There's a line that was very blurry, especially with online discussions, that has sort of disappeared, right? When does the one troll in a comment section seem so left field that it's easy to ignore versus when does that troll represent a very real group of people who hold and harbor a prejudice that is being um, inflamed by by rhetoric from politicians, from, from celebrities, from you know, media. 
it's hard to say then that uh, it's something that you should just brush off as, as easily ignorable. I think at, at this day and age, we have the responsibility to address it because they are, whether we like it or not, a big part of the problem and potentially, hopefully, part of the solution. There is a line in which you know that engagement is, is uh, futile, right? And that is where you should prioritize your own sanity, your own health, your own safety. That's always of utmost importance. But I think that trolling, in essence, has developed beyond, I think, uh, a sad hobby for some and into a real ideology for many. And I think that we see that happening with place with QAnon, with a lot of different pockets that we thought were ignored parts of society, but then they rally and physically storm the capital. And so to ignore it would also be a, a false, a falsehood. I think we have to be vigilant, engage, and try. We have to try our best to help change someone's mind. Oh, I would certainly say that what you're doing with this documentary is hopefully going to change a lot of minds. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what, if anything, YouTube could do better to help with this problem? It's a very layered issue, and I think, and I'm gonna, I'm just gonna call it out, and I'm gonna call myself out in a lot of ways. We we often talk about the sort of democratization of content digitally, that it's open for everyone, it's available for everyone. We are seeing surely way more diverse voices since the advent of, of platforms like YouTube. However, there is also, like any industry, a rising to the top, and many of the rising to the top happen to be very mainstream. Much of what I do just in regards to the everyday work on the channel, my day job, is a far more mainstream version of me that reaches a wider audience because there's a, there's a, it's palatable, you know? Mainstream can mm -hmm. equate to something like whiteness. Then I certainly am aware of that. It's something that I try to combat as much as possible, but that is just the nature of difficult conversations. And I think that when you are approached with something like, how do we help amplify voices? I think a lot of those voices sometimes are going to be hard to watch or hear. And I think a lot of times that is important to recognize that the engagement with the truth is so much tougher to swallow. And it is not only up to the platforms, but it's really up to us to try to lift those, those voices up, no matter how unpopular they might be, while also tempering some of the popular voices that maybe are harming a situation. It is hard to dictate exactly where those lines are drawn, but I think that I cannot separate this idea that I can mainstream myself or present myself in a way that is palatable to many people in one way, in one video, and then turn around and have my documentary or my coming out video and say, this is another version of me. We have to be more fully realized as people because then all of our voices will be, will, will become the mainstream, will become more, right. Right. more solidified yeah. as, as a true unified movement of people who are not afraid to recognize their own flaws and also start addressing the issues that need to be given a voice. But first and foremost, that amplifying, that recognizing of people who are actually delivering the hard hitting truth and the facts and really, really putting themselves out there as activists, those are the voices that we need to start paying more attention to when we are discussing these particular topics. Because as much as I hoped that I could at least spur conversation with my the privilege of my platform um i also readily admit that i might not always be in fact i'm not the best person to refer to for a lot of these issues and all i can do is either direct people to that amplify them and at the very least hopefully start seeing them rise in terms of what they can contribute to all the lessons that we desperately need to learn on a daily basis. It's very well said. It's, uh, you know, from, from, I think what you're 
what you're um, struggling with is sort of the how does an authoritative voice become mainstream right in today's world where anyone can publish and um and you're competing for the user's engagement and how do you do that with truth and and kindness and art and um and and how do you enable others in in the process of it and i think that is what we all strive for it's something that's not easy to achieve but uh but i think we all share the same um uh, same goals and same mission i i also want to applaud your fundraising efforts uh that that you've kicked off for the aip organizations and uh, youtube um will uh, uh financially contribute to those and we want to make sure that we're supportive of your efforts um and obviously we'll encourage uh everyone else uh, to do the same but i'd like to finish with the one thing that you would like people watching your documentary to do one action that they could take in order to improve the situation the hashtag stop asian hate has been trending for a while and i thought an important variation on that was talk asian hate because i think that the sad reality of being on this planet is that things like this these institutions many of them are designed to pit people of color against each other to push certain communities down at any given point in history and the the long running theme of that is the silencing of those groups and i think that in this particular distinct point in the history of asian america and for many asians across the world it's that we can't survive without talking about it we have to talk about it we have to get others to talk about it we have to be outspoken loud proud controversial and ready to take on any sort of dialogue no matter how distressing or challenging we have to be able to hold those in a way where we can get to the next step of this conversation because the entire conversation for generations since many of our parents and grandparents great grandparents first came here has been this feeling that Asians can't speak out about our own struggles and i think that's such a sad and disturbing thought to think that perhaps my grandmother who i just talked to about all of this she said to me why would anyone care when they've never cared about me to begin with she said if they don't even care to learn how to say my name why would they care about my safety and that really stuck with me because that same feeling of if i don't say anything it's fine because i can get through this because of xyz that has to go out the window whether it be you your friends your family people that you don't even get along with online at your dinner table engage and talk Eugene you do and the world is better off with you in it you're an amazing creator amazing person and it's it's truly admirable uh what you're doing and the art you're creating and the messages you're trying to spread so thank you for everything you're doing we're so proud of all of your efforts and um in any way we can help um uh we'll do so and thank you for your contribution to the fundraising effort and the one last thing i would say is if anyone feels compelled to follow someone like me i'm just a dumb dumb old youtuber dumb old filmmaker if you follow me follow triple as many voices that need amplifying women migrants activists people who are working on this uh, on the street level community leaders i've been following like crazy and at the very least even seeing their tweets it has given me so much more of a well-rounded view of what's happening and i only implore people out there to just consider that even my view as hopefully as nuanced and as comprehensive as i present in the documentary is still only one person translating the information and you yourself can do it and come to terms with how you can bring that 
to a lot more people in your own personal life. All right. Thank you, Eugene. Amazing. Thank you.